Hello, welcome to my channel where we discuss the MCC laws of cricket. Today we are discussing law 20 dead ball. Now from the umpire's uh, point of view this is a very important law and every umpire should know the dead ball uh, law quite thoroughly. There are some uh, intricate provisions uh, which need to be applied. You must know how this law operates. Uh, you know very well know that cricket is a stop go game that the ball comes into play and the action goes on for a while and there can be circumstances where the ball then becomes dead and then is then uh, uh, given back to the bowler to bowl again and the whole cycle uh, apply, uh, uh, gets repeated throughout the game the whole cycle gets repeated so at the end always the ball either becomes dead or is called dead in different circumstances there are different there's a list of uh, 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 occasions where the ball will automatically become dead you need to be aware of what those are <coughs> and certain provisions regarding that then there is a big list uh, of uh, occasions where the umpire either umpire or one of the umpires is authorized to call dead ball and uh, uh, again there are certain provisions to be noted there and there have been certain recent changes also in this particular law uh, broadly uh, you have three uh, sections one is the ball automatically becoming dead one single sen uh, uh, case where the ball may be considered dead where nothing applies considered dead and a bigger section which talks about the ball being called dead by the umpire so we will be discussing these in detail let's begin now the ball becomes dead when it is finally settled in the hands of the wicket keeper or of the bowler remember the settling in the is in the hands of the wicket keeper and the bowler no other fielder fine uh, whenever it is finally uh, we very often see that the ball has been thrown back and uh, finally settled uh, it comes to him and then it is passed on to the bowler and all that now here there is something some interesting provision here you come to law 20.2 there is a small explanation about ball uh, finally settled the umpire alone will decide whether the ball is finally settled or not. The umpire alone will decide whether the ball is finally settled or not. Nobody else opinion counts. Now, interestingly, the law uh, uses the word umpire. And if you look at Appendix C, which I hope you already have, uh, several times you might have uh, referred, I always advise people to look up the Appendix C first. There, the use of the word umpire means the bowler and umpire. So it is now if you are at square leg, if I am at square leg and an incident happens, and uh, it was an ambiguous uh, instance whether the ball is to be treated as finally settled or not. Most of the time, most of the time things will be very clear. There will be no need to check this on this opinion. But uh, in ambiguous where the rarest of ambiguous situations if I am faced I need to look at my colleague to check with him uh, whether he considers the ball as finally settled if he tells me dead uh, then I wouldn't give that out but if he doesn't <coughs> uh, he uh, if he doesn't then I should give the uh, batsman out that bad ball is not considered to be dead therefore it is it is not treated as finally settled uh, therefore it is in play uh, his opinion is what will prevail uh, now uh, both all umpires really both and all umpires really ought to be aware of this provision that it is that umpire who the bowler and umpire and apply it in practice I think it is easy to apply in practice like I told you it is in the rarest of rare cases it will happen that the situation is not clear whether it is uh, uh, finally settled or not will not be clear then I just have to look at it. But he has to understand what uh, I am asking for. So therefore, all umpires should be on the same page with regard, with regard to this, your colleague and all. This is not something you will be discussing. But it is a matter of knowing what the law is and then and putting it into practice. Uh, then we go on to another occasion where the ball becomes dead automatically, which is the ball, uh, a boundary is scored readily understandable once the ball reaches the boundary or touches the boundary the ball is dead and the umpire will turn around and signal either four or six to the scorers the batter is dismissed 
whenever a batsman is dismissed any batter is dismissed in any of the way recognized ways the ball becomes dead till that time it remains it becomes dead now well, there is an interesting provision here the ball will be deemed to be dead from the instant of the incident causing the dismissal the ball will be deemed to be dead from the instant of the incident causing the dismissal uh, i can uh, explain this by example or just read what this is it will go back the ball will become dead from not from when the umpire gives him out but it will go back earlier now for instance uh, we had this happen in the ipl we had this happen in the ipl where the ball was hit to square leg a uh, high to square leg behind the umpire and he also broke his wicket uh, the square leg umpire gave the striker out hit wicket and after that the ball was caught behind him uh, the, the umpires asked the scorers to record hit wicket and this was upheld by the mcc on the basis of this provision that once the ball has uh, the decision has been given the ball becomes dead from the instant of the dismissal now uh, though this is the basis though it overrides the precedence law which is there in the, we have not come to it yet but we all know what the precedence law which is in on the court law we have a precedence uh, law which is in the bold uh, law also and therefore uh, here this overrides that that provision we'll come discuss that and pro uh, precedence we will discuss there in detail later on and we'll come back to this provision as well both of them equally apply and but if we are faced with a situation th where what we have what, uh, what i have just told you neither umpire has given anybody out neither umpire has given anybody out and both the decisions are open in that case uh, it is caught that will prevail it is caught that will prevail uh, and the precedence law will be followed that is how these two things will work but remember this provision is there that the ball will be deemed to de be dead from the instant of the incident causing the you given a dismissal then you go back in time and the ball becomes dead from that time right a matter of a few seconds only then we have a provision that the ball lodges in the clothing or equipment of a batter or clothing of an umpire whether played or not it doesn't matter whether it is played or not uh, if the ball lodges in the clothing of either the batter or the umpires the batters or the umpires not any of the fielders remember so therefore if the ball goes into the clothing of a fielder it can be a catch and uh, or he may fish it out if it's not a catch he may fish it out and attempt to uh, get a decision a run out or a wicket keepers uh, the ball goes into the pads of the wicket flap of the pads of the wicket keeper nowadays flaps are pretty small earlier it used to be bigger the flaps used to be bigger but if it goes there and he can pick it up and effect a stumping he can pick it up and effect a stumping so it is not the fielder any of the fielders it is the umpire and any of the batters that the ball becomes there uh, there is an interesting story about this how did this law come about cricket lore has it that at one time when this rule did not exist and uh, if the ball lodged in the clothing of the batter uh, say in his pads uh, he uh, the ball was uh, uh, not dead it remained in play and if it has been played a catch is also possible if uh, the fielder uh, uh, fishes out uh, if the one of the fielders come dives for it and tries to take a catch or takes it out of the pads and claims a catch now uh, it is said that at one time when this rule wasn't there the ball whenever it uh, lodged into the pads of the striker he would start running towards the boundary and uh, try to his intention with the intention of dropping it outside the boundary and claiming a catch uh, claiming six runs a boundary six and we had uh, five or six uh, fielders running after him uh, to retrieve the ball take the uh, catch hold of him bring him down and uh, catch, uh, take the ball out and claim a catch it was uh, more a rugby situation than a cricket situation so the authorities at that time then said no no we are not going to tolerate this kind of thing once this happens ball becomes dead it is a very funny situation and uh, 
funny things happen and therefore funny rules come into play they end the book which has a reason uh, uh, origin in uh, uh, this now in such situation most of the laws will f- you will find have an origin in an incident which has occurred and then in order to ensure that this doesn't happen is not cricket or uh, is more rugby than cricket that the rule is brought the another provision is, th- is that which is quite a recent provision which says that if the ball is uh, trapped even momentarily between the bat and person of a batter or between the items of clothing or equipment whether played or not uh, we have seen incidents where uh, the ball uh, has uh, stopped between the bat and the pad of the striker and uh, momentarily and it then dropped now the ball becomes dead and if the ball which is now coming down is caught it won't be given out caught similarly a ball which has been edged uh, lodged between the two pads two pads of the striker and uh, when it is lodges there uh, not lodges gets trapped there uh, this law will come into operation and the batter cannot be given out if it is a catch and of course after that there can be nothing else possible the ball becomes dead uh, these two uh, go together more or less <coughs> must be under the difference also must be understood <coughs> Uh, then the ball becomes dead if there is an offence under law 24.4. Player returning without permission is not supposed. Whenever he first touches the ball, the ball automatically becomes dead, and uh, illegally fielding the ball. Say he fields it with his handkerchief or he fields it with his uh, uh, cap, takes his cap off and fields it. Uh, the ball automatically becomes dead. As a measure of additional penalty, <coughs> under th- in these two circumstances. the f- ball will not count and all both of these are quite severe offences under the laws and the law provides that these in the case of these two provisions uh, the ball th- there will be an additional penalty given to the fielding side of the ball not being counted that means the batting side will get one extra ball there are two other provisions we'll come across them maybe i'll come across we'll come across a list of those uh, right here but uh, we'll discuss them in detail later on there are two there are a total of four such occasions five and uh, five run penalty occasions which after which uh, that ball isn't counted all right <coughs> and we have also stated that if you remember uh, valid balls when we discuss valid balls these are the four exceptions even though the bo- uh, striker has had an opportunity to play the ball in these four cases even then the ball will not be counted in over we already discussed in law 17 uh and again when there is a contravention of law 28.3 which is uh, the ball striking the helmet of the fielding side uh, which is uh, which has been placed uh, behind the wicket keeper uh here is another interesting provision that the ball becomes dead automatically uh when the match is concluded in any of the ways stated in the law uh now here uh we have seen this law operate in the case of winning hit and extras uh, when we when the match when we discuss uh, the uh, when a match is concluded uh, and a match is concluded when uh, the number of runs uh, required are scored so if two runs are required if two runs are required to win the match and the two uh, batters have run those runs before the ball reaches the boundary the ball becomes dead automatically that ball reaching the boundary is of no consequence it is of no consequence at all it won't count as if it never happened the, the ball becomes dead there uh, and there is another parallel that if one run is required and uh, uh, a wide is called even though it is called later a wide is called it will be effective from the time the bowler entered his delivery stride so the run is counted that dismissal won't count and one run required to win that side is one the match is concluded that is why that stump will not count so uh, you have to uh, remember these things then we have to we come to a, another interesting provision the ball shall be considered to be dead when it is clear to the bowlers and umpire that the fielding side and both batters at the wicket have ceased to regard it as in play we have already seen what uh, finally ball finally settled was where it is as i mentioned 
it is the umpire the bowlers and um, the um, bowlers and umpires whose opinion will prevail now the ball has not reached the uh, bowler or the wicket keeper so quite naturally law 20.2 finally settled doesn't apply quite clearly so therefore this is another provision the ball has come to slip it has been thrown from the deep and the wicket keeper has caught it the nobody else has caught slip has caught it now it settles in his hand for some time it is there in his hand for some time and uh, here there are actions to the bowler and umpire from the like that the thrilling side has uh, started to consider the ball is red and the batters are also within their crease and after a few seconds the batter goes out to one of the batters goes out to tap the wicket because the bowler and umpire considers the ball to have been uh, considered it as red he will not allow a throw to claim a run out because once his opinion is formed the ball is red and further action will not count again here <coughs> because it is a bowler and provision like for ball finally settled i would want umpires to be clear about what the law is it is the bowler and umpire who's uh, there it is only umpire stated but it means bowler and umpire here it is specifically stated it is the bowler and umpire so if i am faced with the situation that slip uh, the striker steps out for a second and this man the swift fielder who is with whom the ball rested for a while <coughs> has uh, then broken the wicket what do i do if the two uh, umpires are in tandem and they are uh, okay with this law and uh, on the pain uh, same page as this i just have to look at him and if he says dead uh, not out but if he says no in play so you have to give him out but remember in both these cases it is the bowlers and umpire whose opinion prevails should prevail that is the law now it is for us to implement this law properly it will be again the rarest of rare cases but you should not be caught on the wrong foot wrong foot <coughs> now uh, we have now we've uh, discussed the ball becoming automatically dead and the ball being considered dead now we come to the provisions uh, here there is one uh, more thing before we come to the provisions regarding umpires calling and signaling dead ball the uh, ball umpire calls a ball dead there are many provisions there <coughs> before that there is uh, i must draw your attention to law 20.3 call of over or time the law says that call of over or time call of time is to be made only when the ball is dead other than in 20.1 becomes dead or is considered dead or 20 umpire calls and signal dead ball and or, or under 20.4 now <coughs> the call of over or time does not make the ball dead if you see the list ball becoming dead earlier call of over call of time used to be in that list of ball becoming dead so call of over rendered the ball dead call of time rendered the ball dead it has been taken out of those provisions and umpires have been instructed very clearly please wait please wait before calling time and uh, over please wait let the ball become dead and then you uh, can call over and walk away otherwise there can be an awkward situation of course if he <coughs> is considers the <coughs> ball becoming dead or uh, if he considers uh, is considered dead now he is considered it dead dead then in that case uh, there is a situation prevailing he can call over and go is already dead in his view he can call over and go uh, but otherwise in um, any other situation if ball is in the air it is on its way you call over and turn your back and go away if an ugly, ugly situation can uh, take place behind your back for which there will be no answer for which if you are questioned about it for, for you there will be no answer to give because it's no, not in that rest ball has not even come at rest you can't consider it dead Uh, on what basis and the uh, call of your over doesn't render the ball dead uh, will you allow that incident to happen you not even seen that incident you turned your back on the action and gone away so my advice to all umpires is take heed of this particular provision uh, remember that the call of over and the call of time does not become dead the laws instruct that wait till the ball becomes dead or you may consider is a situation where you consider it dead once you have done that you are free to call
uh, over or time at time. I would want you to hit this. Now coming to the umpire's calling and signaling dead ball, which is quite a long list and there are many provisions there which uh, require the attention of the umpire. When the ball has become dead under 20.1 is one uh, small tip here. There are, there are whenever the ball has become dead under any has become dead, uh, and the umpire, but the umpire is still free to call and signal dead ball, just to inform the players and arrest the game. Sometimes the players will not quite realize that the ball has become dead, and they will uh, be in a flurry to uh, take uh, action, try to get a run out or do whatever. What the umpire needs to do is the law says is even then the ball has become he needs to inform the players dead ball. So that let's arrest all action, let's arrest all actions. No explanation is required. The ball is dead, and tell them the ball is already dead. You can tell them the ball is, but you can make a call just to inform the law allows you to do it. In, and in fact, I would advise all umpires to do that whenever the occasion the occasion occurs. Uh, just because become dead, they uh, don't know uh, the laws. So therefore, they'll the, they'll be in a flurry of action, which you can uh, should try and arrest immediately. Uh, where either umpire required to call and signal dead ball under law 2421 to 2414, there are 14 instances which will follow. The ball will be considered to be dead at the instant of the incident causing the ball to become dead. Now this is one important, very important addition. In all these cases, 1 to 14, in all these cases, 1 to 14, I am not listing the long number, 1 to 14, uh, this principle applies that the ball will be considered to be dead at the instant of the incident causing the ball to become dead. You call dead ball, the call will be become effective few moments earlier few a few moments only earlier so that anything that happens after that particular moment in the past uh, till the calling of dead ball ha is of no consequence uh, there can be many examples of this uh, really i'll uh, tell you uh, but there is an exception to this there are a couple of laws where the umpire is uh, required to delay the call of no ball umpire is required to delay the call of no ball in order to allow uh, the fielding side to obtain and take a run out or whatever. There are two laws there. In such cases, this won't apply. This won't apply. In that, those two cases, the ball will become dead from the instant of the call. Now, we will discuss those in detail again and I will come back and refer this to you, uh, uh, remind you of this provision uh, in the dead ball law when we discuss that particular law. <coughs> Those laws are the restriction <coughs> on the striker's runner, <coughs> sorry, and runs permitted in a ball lawfully struck more than once. Uh, law 41.2.1 unfair actions, 42.0 unacceptable conduct. In all of these cases, the umpire is supposed to call. There are four of these cases, we will discuss them in detail, where the principle of ball becoming dead from the past, retrospectively, only a few moments less than a minute, less than 30 seconds, less than 15 seconds, uh, it will become dead from that point onwards, except in these four cases. We will discuss these four cases uh, in a while. Two instances about the batters and uh, two about unfair conduct, one about unfair play and unfair conduct. Now we come to the list of uh, all instances where the umpire can uh, call dead ball. It is either umpire who shall call and signal dead ball. Now the signal uh, call has to be uh, accompanied by a signal. So call and signal dead ball. Let us go over these uh, instances. One is intervening in, intervening in, intervening in any case of unfair play. The first action that the umpire does in whenever he intervenes in any case of unfair play is to call dead ball, arrest the game, and then uh, take the required action but he will first call dead ball. Uh, or there is a possible serious injury to a player or, or umpire occurs. A possible serious injury occurs to a uh, player or umpire. Now again, uh, let us see how this works in tandem with uh, when the ball will be considered to be dead at the instant of. Now see, for example, uh, 
earlier a player suffers a serious injury and uh, there is a delay in the call of a uh, dead ball from the umpire or he simply fails to do it a lot of times there won't be time uh, and he is also perhaps taken a gas or he is himself hurt and one of the the maybe the other umpire and the ball goes and strikes the wicket like in the first instance uh, it is hit the striker and the ball goes and strikes the wicket uh an opinion prevailed that uh, an opinion prevailed that yes before the call of dead ball whatever has happened has happened and the batter has to be given out run out even though seriously injured but here under this provision the call of dead ball will render the ball dead from the instant of the incident that has occurred so it is now open that the injured uh, batter will not be given out ball that is what will arise from this particular law uh, this can uh, this is regarding possible serious injury to a player or umpire i'll uh, uh, discuss in uh, detail the effect of uh, uh, this particular law 20.4.2 when we come to each of these because it says that uh, where where either umpire is required to call and signal dead ball under 20.4.2.1 to 14 in all these cases this principle will be applied so therefore i do not think that i am wrong in saying that uh, that wouldn't be given out uh, earlier there would be there was simply no provision uh, i can i will uh, uh, come to other instances and uh, by the end perhaps you will be uh, you'll agree with me that this is how the law has to be applied earlier there were many there are many instances where just because the umpire has not called uh, uh, dead ball Uh, what has happened before the call of dead ball uh, stays, uh, which was found to be not very correct or even fair, and therefore this provision has been brought. And I'll discuss them in a bit. Let us uh, finish with these fourteen rules. All right. Uh, we've uh, come to two now. Leaving uh, his or her normal position for consultation when either umpire leaves his for normal position for consultation with his colleague. this first action should be dead ball because uh, we do not want any something uh, unpleasant occurring behind our back where we are not even looking at the action it is very important for your own safety that you call it always you always must dead ball and then proceed and talk to your colleague when you are leaving your position but eye to eye contact and consultation uh, good umpires will always do it and uh, uh, yes that's a catch yes or uh, is that doubt caught yes do you consider the ball dead he says no so you don't have to move from your position a lot of consultation i'd say 90% concern of the consultation takes place through uh, eye to eye contact that is the kind of teamwork that is required uh, for of umpires to do good umpires will always excel at it and if you're uh, uh, you've been umpiring together for a long time you'll be used to each other but then i think this is something that you should settle with uh, some new colleague right in the beginning when you first meet him look uh, you, we don't have to meet each other in the middle no waste of time i look at you you, you know what i am talking about and uh, yes no you have to answer that is all that is how consultation mostly works you don't have to go into a, get into a huddle all the time uh one or both bails fall from the striker's wicket before the striker has had an opportunity of playing the ball now we've seen very often uh, that the ball uh, as the bowler comes running up neither the umpire saw it nor uh, the uh, striker realized it nor the bowler realized it. he bowls the ball but one of the bails has fallen down now even now suppose suppose i'll give you two instances uh, so just suppose that uh, in case the umpire has noticed it has noticed it but it can very well happen that it happens at the absolutely absolutely last fraction of a second there is no chance for him to uh, uh, call dead ball and the ball strikes the wicket and goes away for runs or the other bail also comes down then the umpire calls dead ball Re uh, now having realized the call comes after the ball has hit the wicket and the wicket is broken i would i would and tell me if you agree i would apply 20.4.2 the ball becomes dead retrospectively from the time of the incident 
and my uh, lapse in calling uh, dead ball the, uh, the what has happened afterwards will not count uh, there uh, see what happens is why this provision is there the original provision of the umpire calling dead ball is there that the wicket is no longer uh, of the standard regulations and one bail being down puts the fielding side at a disadvantage of for the purpose of claiming a bold here it seems uh, it is all right that uh, the ball has brought down the other bail and so that thing doesn't apply but suppose the ball had hit the uh, off stump which uh, no longer has a bail and the ball is deflected through the slips and it goes away for uh, four runs that would be four buys it would be a disadvantage to the fielding side and also they have lost their uh, right for claiming a uh, wicket so in these circumstances it is now provided that let us finish off the matter we don't want to discuss the pro, uh, uh, possibilities when a bail falls the umpire calls red ball and uh, even if he does later it will apply apply retrospectively and that bowl won't count and the buy won't count now there was an incident which happened uh, in a test match uh, recently i think i think it was in uh, india versus england in india where uh, a bail fell nobody noticed it this it fell very quietly it fell there was no high wind or uh, very quietly it fell the video shows us and the bowler then umpire didn't see it the square leg umpire didn't see it and the, uh, it was played or something i don't know what happened to the ball but uh, it was struck played uh, here and there no runs were taken for that and when everybody noticed there was a claim for uh, hit wicket the third umpire looked at it the action and we all saw along with the third umpire that the bail quietly fell down at the base of the off stump the square leg umpire having seen it, the third umpire having seen it said dead ball that bail has fallen down dead ball but the one of the field umpires was heard saying no uh, it won't be dead ball we haven't seen it therefore we will not call dead ball uh, and we'll allow things to stand so dead ball wasn't called the bo extra ball wasn't given uh, this takes care of that even if with the intervention of the third umpire we uh, see that the bail has fallen a dead ball is called that dead ball will have effect Uh, retrospective effect so uh, an umpire's lapse in this regard now uh, will not stand should not stand so this is an opening given uh, for the umpires to correct the situation this situation does allow them to correct that their own lapse sometimes when it can happen i'll give you some other examples also perhaps yes of course right there in the next one Uh, 20.4.2.5 says that the striker is not ready for the delivery of the ball, and if the ball is delivered, makes no attempt to play it. Now, we have a situation that the striker backs off from the delivery and makes no attempt to play. He might have been initially ready, but when the ball is coming to him, the ball is on the on his on its way. It could be very late. It could be. Uh, it could be early it could be late or whatever it is right upon him the ball is right upon him but he backs off maybe a fly got into his uh, a gnat got into his uh, uh, in front of his face or whatever we do not know at the inst at that instant we do not know at that instant remember we do not know what is the reason for his backing off but the facts are that he wasn't ready to play and he backed off he made no effort to play had he made an effort to play he wouldn't be allowed any call of dead ball he should now just because he was ready to play in the first instance this law still applies so the point is he is not ready to play it and he backs off he does makes no effort to play it the ball is on the way now the thing is uh, the umpire may err in not calling dead ball or he simply doesn't have the time to do it now in when it is a fraction of a second thing he is not the ball has gone and struck the wicket should we allow that ball to stand there has been a video in circulation uh, over the last year or so where there a lot of argument about uh, no what has happened before the call of dead ball uh, will stand but here the law now allows us the umpire to correct his error if that is or uh, the 
striker to that he is not uh, ready and he is uh, he is re uh, retrieved and he is not to be given out ball i got dead ball and the dead ball takes effect from the time of the occurrence of that incident goes back in time and takes place uh, will be considered dead from that point that therefore the ball striking the stumps is of no consequence is of no consequence right now here there is something so this is how law 20.4.2 will apply uh, into all of these uh, we'll discuss uh, uh, as we come there are 14 instances i will come to just five number five uh there is another where the striker is distracted by any noise or movement or in any other way now before that before the, before we discuss this there is something i was uh, starting beginning to mention then i forgot uh now here provide look at this provision provided the umpire is satisfied that the striker had adequate reason for not being ready the ball shall not count as one of the over now the incident has happened nobody knows except the striker the reason for his uh, withdrawing uh, not playing i as umpire have to go and inquire from him i have to call dead ball in all cases 100% 100 out of 100 cases i have to call dead ball that is my duty whether in time or late i don't i simply don't uh, know that reason and i'm not supposed to go into he is stepped back and my job is to take 100 times out of 100 to call dead ball after that i'll go and talk to the batter from a distance of course what's the problem and he'll probably tell me this is what happened a bird flew from behind the bowler or a gnat came in my way or uh, whatever a fly buzzed in my ear and he had to back off all right but if he finds the reason unacceptable the bowler then umpire will go and inquire he finds the reason unacceptable all he can do is count the ball in the over that extra ball won't be given the extra ball will not be given so he will count the ball uh, in that over which does not mean that he should give the striker out ball no that is not open that option is not open dead ball is called he has to be said whether early or late it is he has to be uh, he cannot be out under no circumstances can he be out all right once he is uh, backed off he cannot be out now what is open to the umpire is that to have a look uh, inquire into the reason and after either he doesn't count the ball let him have the ball extra ball uh, being satisfied about the reason when he is not satisfied about the reason uh, all he can do is allow uh, let that ball delivery stand and the batting side loses that one delivery he's not played it your reason for not playing is not uh, i'm not happy with that i'm not giving you an extra ball that is all he can do right now the striker is distracted we have a situation where the striker is distracted by any noise or movement or in any other way while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery he is distracted there is a loud noise uh, whether on the field or whether outside can be in the pebble uh, in the a uh, sense a loud noise in the sand something happens a low aircraft uh, fighter aircraft flies and if you heard a low uh, fi fighter aircraft uh, going over your head pretty low it can be a devastating uh, thing you will uh, duck instinctively it has happened to me so any a while preparing to receive or receiving a delivery the umpire is supposed to call dead ball the umpire is supposed to call dead ball this shall apply whether the source of distraction is within the match or outside it if it is there is something that the, the close in fielder sneezes violently and he, this man is distracted now again in this uh, this situation again the ball shall not count as one of the over is uh, very clearly given it shall not count as one of the uh, over in, in such a case and uh, in all cases and again Uh, the lapse of the umpire in not calling dead ball will doesn't mean that he will should be given out he was distracted so even if there is there can be a situation where the umpire either there is a lapse on his part to call or there simply no time there simply no time for him more likely that 
most umpires if they see him distracted the big line that dead ball is an instinct that comes but uh, sometimes there is no time and if the ball has gone and hit the wicket please don't uphold it take refuge in 20.4.2 that allows you to do it ball becomes dead from the occurrence of the incident please don't give him out right then uh, there is an instance of deliberate attempt to distract e in under either laws 41.4 or 41.5 after the that the 41.4 applies to a striker while taking strike has been deliberately distracted by a member of the fielding side 41.5 uh, is deliberate distraction and deception and obstruction which is quite uh, broad uh, the offense uh, we'll come to that uh, later uh, the ball shall not count as now here in all both these cases again Uh, when there is such a distraction the umpire is supposed to call dead ball and the ball shall not count in the over now we spoke of two occasions where uh, the ball will not count in the over and now these are two more uh, under unfair play where for the even though fire and penalty is given uh, the ball will not count in the over the batter has we saw in under law 17 these exceptions were reiterated there where the general principle being that the uh, if the striker has had an opportunity to play the ball the ball will be counted but this is these are two exceptions here and we also saw two other where the illegal fielding and fielder coming in illegally and fielding the ball these are four instances where the ball is not to be counted despite the fact that he had an opportunity to play it so this is Uh, by way of an uh, additional penalty given to the fielding side imposed upon the fielding side and additional punishment given to them for those four unfair acts you must remember these because these four are different uh, and that one ball should not be counted if despite of the fact that he had an opportunity to play that ball fine uh, the bowler drops the ball accidentally before delivery before delivery is what uh, is important and the umpire calls we seen it very often that he stops on his uh, run up or his do ball drops out of his hand before delivery or even uh, in his bowling stride uh, he drops the ball uh, you call uh, it is before delivery and uh, even when he is uh, sort of uh, before delivery it goes astray and you rec uh, recognize the fact that it was not a proper delivery ball properly delivered ball it would come under this category where you should be calling dead ball fine the bowler drop the fine the bowler throws the ball towards the striker's end before entering his delivery stride now this is a new provision which has been brought into effect uh, from th 1st october 2022 under uh, the third edition uh, 2022 of the 2017 code uh, earlier there was uh, the situation was left pretty the, it was a no ball call it was whenever the bowler throws the ball at the striker's wicket it was always a no ball call but there were several uh, uh, questions about uh, what follows after that is he allowed to hit it whether uh, runs would be allowed and all those remain unanswered in the uh, in the laws were always raised these bogies were always raised by umpires over the years uh, i have my throughout my career all these things discussions have gone on now this has been put at rest Uh, if the bowler throws the ball at the striker's wicket uh, before delivery is that there before entering into his delivery stride dead ball invariably it is dead ball there is no question of a no ball if it is uh, in his delivery stride it will be treated like a normal throw and no ball will be called but before delivery either umpire i cannot see it if i am at the bowler's end my colleagues at square leg can see it that ball is what he should be doing he has seen him throw the uh, ball before delivery as far as i am concerned it could have been a bold delivery properly bold from behind me or besides me but my umpire uh, my colleague there can see that it was a thrown delivery that ball but before before thrown ball not a delivery it was a thrown ball uh throws the ball towards the striker then the ball does not leave the bowler's hand for any reason other than in an attempt to run him out the non striker under law 38.3 uh 
Uh, another provision where the umpire will uh, is instructed to call uh, dead call and signal dead ball is where the ball does not leave the bowler's hand for any reason. If it doesn't leave, and quite instinctively, if you are a practice umpire, the ball doesn't leave his hand. Very instinctively, you will be calling dead dead ball is what you will say. You don't see the ball, you don't spot the ball, but when uh, the ball has not left his hand for the reason of attempt to run out which he can do till a particular time limit the bowler can do it uh, can uh, retain the ball in that case dead ball will not be called and run out will be allowed but again uh, when we come to law 38.3 there is a time frame uh, during which that thing has to happen the run out has to happen if it is outside that time frame I would call dead ball, right? And not allow the run out. Uh, satisfied that the ball in play cannot be recovered. Now, uh, there is a ball in play, there is a tree like, uh, uh, there is a tree in the ground which has not been decided as a boundary and the ball is hit into that tree and it rests among the leaves or uh, upper branches. Nobody can go up and, and we will not want a situation where uh, 35 runs are run by the uh, two batters at the wicket. This replaces the earlier lost ball uh, call which was there, which in such situations allowed the fielding side to call lost ball. And uh, then the runs that would be given would be either it would be 6 or more if they have run more than 6. That provision used to be there, but uh, now it is done away with. Now it is left to the umpire that if, if there is a situation that he is satisfied that the ball in play uh, cannot be recovered, as soon as it is clear to him or it goes under un into a uh, rabbit hole which is on the ground and not cross the boundary and nobody is, uh, the umpire, a player complains, I can't reach that ball, it is there. Or it could very well be that uh, there is a dog standing over it or a snake standing over it where over the ball or a kite has uh, sort of uh, grabbed the ball and uh, uh, doesn't want to leave it nobody can approach that kite uh, kite is on the ground and now in such these situations it, when it is clear that the ball cannot be recovered the umpire is required to call dead ball and whatever runs uh, we will come to the number of runs to be given whatever runs that are, have already been run will be taken will be allowed uh, we'll come to that uh, later. In such uh, cases, uh, that uh, runs to be when we saw law 18, runs till the moment of calling of dead ball in all these occasions will have to count. Fine, including the run in progress provided across and the position of the two batters retained till that time. Uh, now there is no reason for the uh, uh, umpire to wait, uh, keep on letting them run. He should uh, take a decision quite early. Uh, maybe maybe two three runs and then it will become clear that the ball is not recoverable uh, he shouldn't anticipate he should not uh, act in uh, haste but uh, there is no way he should uh, wait till the original uh, law lost ball law of six runs and all that no try to take action as soon as possible and once you've decided that ball is not retrievable cannot be recovered it is in play that ball is what you should do and action is runs taken and batsman's uh, position will be retained at that time as at that time right uh, he or she considers that either side has been disadvantaged by a person animal or other object within the field of play however if both umpires consider the ball would have reached the boundary now we have seen under the boundary law only the other day that there is provision that if the ball comes in contact with a person or uh, uh, it is a person or uh, animal uh, an animal uh, I gave an example of a ball hitting the dog there somewhere close to the boundary no uh, chance of a ball the fielder uh, coming behind the ball I would the umpire should give that a ball now it is this applies also to an object which has is on the ground an object could be uh, another ball which has come in from the one of the spectators some children or it could be a flag or it could be a banner or simply whatever whatever and has come in contact with the ball now there are two things both of these things apply parallelly it is open for the umpire to call it a boundary and allow a boundary 
but if he sees that the either side is disadvantaged by that particular action uh, then in that case uh, he should call dead ball and not allow any further things to happen Short should not allow any further things to happen both these regulations can go together will go to are supposed to go together and can go together you must uh, think uh, about this about how your mind should be clear about how these two uh, things go together when you go out into a match it can very well happen in a match where there are spectators or even if there are there can always be obstruction on the field of play and when that happens these two things apply i think i had given an example when we discussed that uh, provision where uh, say here in this context uh, at mid wicket shot mid wicket a ball hit the chest of the ball uh, dog which is there and he ran away yelping but a fielder picked up the ball and effected a run out this law now allows me to call it a dead ball because very clearly the batting side has been disadvantaged by the interference of that uh, object by coming into contact all right then we come to another one which is 13 the striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his or her person whether grounded or raised remains within the pitch as defined in 6.1 we have the definition uh, this is one important provision uh, which requires some elaboration uh, j- uh, now we know what the pitch is let me read it out the umpire shall either umpire shall call and signal dead ball when the striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his uh, person whether grounded or raised remains within the pitch remains within the pitch the pitch as defined in 6.1 we all know what a pitch is uh, 10 by 66 is our pitch where uh, you should be clearly be able to see a pitch where the pitch starts and ends so what i suggest to you i detest that marking a white line on the edge of the the length uh, outside the length of the pitch i detest that practice because uh, as a matter of principle i want do not like extraneous marks other than those are prescribed under the laws uh, even my one foot marker is i try to avoid a uh, i try to avoid a chalk line i do it by using a spike anyway everybody can do what he wishes to do Uh, and i also try to avoid my uh, bowler's mark to mark my uh, umpire's mark you know now it is the umpire's mark is made i avoid it i make a uh, spike i carry a spike which i use to renew my mark there is a quiet thing to do uh, nothing obtrusive uh, now here coming to this the, the ball striker attempts to play the ball and no part of his person now you see uh, this has some background in recent occurrences in fact uh, i was uh, there could be others too but i was in a, in some way responsible for this law coming into being when it, my interactions with the mcc uh what had happened was uh, some instances happened where in the ipl uh, i think there were two instances in the ipl where uh, the batter chased the ball it the ball ballooned the ball ballooned and went uh, towards the backward of square and the striker chased the ball right up to there behind the wicket right up to there and uh, attempted to play it uh and uh, it could uh, when and when you are in the uh, this thing uh, temper to make the ball either you are not going to care whether there is a fielder next to you or something you will slash at the ball and it is very grave risk to the fielder there so the question arose the whether the striker is allowed to go and play there the risk apart i am talking about the law and also there was another incident if i recall i had quoted two incidents ha huh, yes the uh, the batter was an australian i believe and he played the bowler shoaib akhtar's ball which was a uh, uh a free hit ball where it did not matter if it struck the stumps uh the striker went 5 feet behind played that ball 5 you will not remember played that ball 5 feet behind the stumps 5 to 6 feet behind the stumps now the question arises whether he can go and do it if it is sideways 
uh, yes, he was allowed to do it because uh, uh, sideways because earlier he, he could be allowed. He was allowed to do it because uh, the law allowed him to play a, a ball which has gone astray as long as it is a properly delivered ball. Of course, now if the ball passes for some time, if the ball uh, pitches outside the uh, wicket, uh, it's called no ball. It's called no ball. But he's allowed to. He was allowed to go and hit it. Now, uh, in discussion with the MCC or and uh, the paper which I sent to them, my point was simply this: that looking at some various laws, even the white ball law, once the ball passes the striker's wicket, umpire calls red ball, and uh, uh, all of that and there, there was earlier a provision which said that uh, in case a ball is uh, bowled uh, and it uh, wide of the wicket and until uh, uh, it stops the striker is allowed to hit it until uh, it uh, passes the wicket he is allowed to hit it. So therefore into my mind uh, looking at some of the laws there is very clearly uh, demarcating uh, dem uh, an a, a line demarcating the domain of the wicketkeeper and the uh, batter, which can be no other than the line of the striker's wicket, line of the striker. So I presented to them an argument that look, you shouldn't be allowed to play behind. There is no way the striker should be allowed to play behind the wicket, which is absolutely wrong. And I also mentioned that there is. Uh, very severe risk of uh, a fielder getting injured. Very genuine risk of a fielder, especially in the slam bang uh, era of uh, the T20. Uh, so now they, the lawmakers, there was no discussion really, but the lawmakers perhaps picked up that point and they applied it to all deliveries which are off the pitch. As long as he can play the ball, the therefore this provision is that he can play the ball as long as he has some part of his body on the uh, pitch. Body or uh, no part of his uh, or her person, whether ground or raised, remains uh, within the pitch is what it says. We will come also to the no ball law. We will come there also. Then here the striker and we'll also come to the where there is a striker's right to play the ball it all it affects this provision affects many laws really uh, and uh, earlier this was also in the domain of no ball no ball would be called but he was allowed to hit it now no longer no longer can you now see a striker chasing the ball to backward of square or going behind the wicket to play shoy bakhtar and bang him to the cover he uh, did it the second time and that was a 2011 incident but the MCC at that time nobody saw it as uh, anything wrong it went along they went along with it twice it happened in the IPL which I noticed and uh, now no longer can if the ball is going towards uh, uh, a little wide and the batter is not able to play it with his uh, part of any part of his person it will be called dead ball. It will be called dead ball. We will come to the no ball uh, part of it later. It will be called dead ball. He has to have some part of his person uh, on the uh, our bat over the pitch area. So that limits his uh, domain sideways also, sideways and on at the other end, wicket keepers end also. I was mainly concerned in my uh, paper to the MCC was about behind the wicket. But they, it seems, uh, appreciated the fact that there can be severe injury to a fielder and which in their paper they have stated that there was a genuine risk in today's days of a uh, ball a batter being hit by a fielder being hit by a uh, rampaging uh, batter. They have disallowed all of that. We do not simply do not want it, and just to add, uh, so those are sideways also and behind. Either way, this applies. The principle to apply is that he should be on the pitch while he is playing the ball. Uh, there is a parallel in the no ball law also, where on account of the way the uh, bowler has uh, delivered the ball, which uh, makes him uh, go out and play the ball, no ball will be called. So therefore, no ball will be there and so will uh, dead ball. Both things will go together there in that case. 
where it is induced by the uh, bowler that uh, going to play is induced by the bowler uh, it will be a no ball but where the bowler has not induced that like uh, i'll give you an example the bowler if you remember recall i could show a video at any time if you recall shoy bakhtar's deliveries were very close to the stumps there was no way he was responsible for the striker going behind and playing if in today's day that ball is delivered again and the striker plays in that manner that will be a dead ball no penalty will uh, apply to the bowler but if the ball has gone astray uh, has left his hand and gone astray a properly delivered ball and the striker is uh, induced or uh, the bowler is responsible for the delivery and because of that the striker has to go there and play it the no ball will be called and so will dead ball that is the difference between the two two video clips should uh, be able to make things uh, clear uh, this point very clear to you where no ball is to be called and where no ball is not to be called uh, we'll come to the no ball call i'll discuss this again when we come to it uh, we come to 20.4.2.14 required to do so under any of the laws not included above now these are 14 items there are these are 14 items uh, where which are listed here uh, as uh, occasions where the um, Uh, either umpire will call and signal dead ball but a lot of the laws uh, provide for uh, calling of dead ball which are not listed here any student umpire i would urge him to go over the laws and there are quite a bit i think there are 20 or so uh, occasions where an umpire is supposed to call dead ball but which is not included in this list so make a list prepare that list and uh, be up to date now uh, this brings us to uh, we we've had a long session almost an hour we'll take a break here and conclude dead ball law uh, in the next episode bye